Welcome to Rubyvale in Queensland, Australia. We're about a 900 kilometer drive northwest of the capital of Brisbane in the region known as the Sapphire Gem Fields. It is here that the majority of Queensland sapphires are mined. Today, we're gonna to get to take a look at a mid-scale underground mine. We'll then get to go and see the cutter finishing and polishing the gemstone. And finally, we'll get to finish up and see how a gem gets put into a finished piece of jewelry. Queensland sapphires are thought to have formed up to 200 million years ago, though there is still some debate as to whether they formed in either igneous or metamorphic conditions. After their formation, they were brought to the surface by volcanic processes and were eventually released from the host rock by weathering and erosion. Through natural concentration processes, due to its high density, sapphire accumulates in various layers of gravel known as wash when transported down rivers and streams. It is this wash that miners seek, whether it be a rich primary wash formed from an original deposit and waterway, or a secondary wash formed later by new streams cutting across and redistributing older gravel deposits. We've come to a local mine now, here in Rubyvale, owned by the Brown family. This mine is typical of your medium scale underground sapphire mining. We will go about 25 metres under the ground and we'll get to see exactly how the gravel is mined and extracted. The clay rich overburden has quite good structural integrity, allowing for only minimal use of structural supports, relying rather on the stable arch design of the tunnels to largely support themselves. So we're here in a nice little drive that I've dug away so that we can see the different layers of wash. We've got the decomposed granite here, which is the bottom of the ancient riverbeds, which we're following along. And everything above that is all this nice, good, crunchy, different size conglomerate sapphire wash that we're chasing. So here you've got some nice boulders, quartzite boulders, silicate, all down on the floor. The granite jumps up at different sections and that's what we're chasing, some nice little holes and different layers. So here we have an old rectangular shaft that were dug by the old timers, probably sometime around the turn of the last century. They've just dug a hole down by hand, probably 20 meters or so. And what they've wanted, they've wanted to find sapphires in this nice wash layer right off the floor. And if they didn't find any, they would just get up and go and dig another hole. So you can see here a very, very small amount of diggings before they decided that it wasn't gonna pay well enough and they just got out. In this area of the gem fields, the use of machinery is restricted to small immobile and handheld equipment. Practices such as this allow for a more sustainable approach to the management of the deposit. Once enough of the gravel wash has been excavated, it is shoveled into a small mining cart and brought to a bucket system which connects the above ground wash plant to the underground mine. At the top of the wash plant, the bucket of gravel is first dumped over a heavy set of bars called a grizzly. This is the first separation process and removes any large boulders which may be in the mix. Once in the hopper below the grizzly, the material is carried by a conveyor belt and fed into a mechanism called a trommel. It is here that the gravel is classified and concentrated into a small amount of sapphire bearing ore with the fine sand and silt being removed by the outer mesh and the larger rocks dropping out the end of the trouble. This process is carefully controlled to make sure that only stones within a certain size range go through to the final concentration process. Sapphires under a certain size will not have enough commercial value to be recovered. The miners also know from experience what size range the sapphires generally occur in thus allowing them to screen out larger material with very little risk of losing any stones of value. The final concentration process happens in the pulsator. Many gemstones have a high specific gravity. What this means is if you have a sapphire of equal size with a mineral like quartz, the sapphire will be much heavier than the quartz even though they are the exact same size. Concentrated gem bearing gravel is fed into the pulsator bed which is obstructed by a series of ribs. Water is continually flowing through the system and is constantly pulsing up and down. 
This effectively bounces the gravel over the set of ribs and out the end of the pulsator bed. The concentration occurs because miners are careful to control both the strength and the speed of the water pulses to ensure that there is enough force to bounce lighter minerals like quartz and felspar over the ribs and out of the system, but not enough force to bounce materials like sapphire, garnet or zircon past the first two or three ribs. When the time is right, the plant is shut down and each partition of the pulsator is inspected for gem material. The top layer does usually not contain any sapphires, and most gems will usually be trapped within the first few sections. Once a sapphire is mined and extracted from the earth, the next step in the process is for the stone to be faceted and polished into a finished gemstone. We're now about to head to the Ruby Vale Gem Gallery, where we will get to see this process from start to finish. Peter has been part of the community here in Ruby Vale for over 44 years. In that time, he has set up a successful business that mines, cuts and polishes, and sets sapphires into finished jewellery. I sat down with Peter to gain insight into the process of selecting and cutting a sapphire, and to learn more about the trade he has come to know so well. So the most important thing about deciding which sapphire is going to cut a really nice sapphire, you've got to look for clarity, You've got to sort of look at the stone as much as looking through the stone. When you look at it, you can sort of try and judge the density of colour. It, and it also depends on the shape of the stone, what colour, whether it's a straight blue stone or whether it's a party colour sapphire or a green. And sapphires have the, a table and a cross table. So as much as possible, you can try and keep the table of the stone looking down the sea axis. And, and there's only a very small percentage of what we actually mine, we actually cut. About 20% of what we mine is actually some kind of sapphire crystal, some kind of solid crystal. The rest is fairly much corundum, fully shattered, that we sell as low grade. But out of that 20%, we probably only cut around about five to 10% of really good stones. So half of those, or more than half, probably need heat treating to clarify them a little bit. And some are really quite, quite nice with a tiny bit of silk in them or the right color to cut as a untreated sapphire. So that's the qualities that we're looking for to make a decision about cutting a stone. One thing about that, and the other, the basic process is that we preform the stone on a rough diamond lap to start with. So we shape it up to make sure that it's as accurate as possible without it, taking all the cracks out, getting the pavilion of the shape properly, getting the crown shape properly and the circumference of the stone. Then we dop it up and the cutting process means cutting that we always cut the bottom of the stone first. So you know that you've got you can see where the, any, any problems are and you can get it to a point and then and you can see when you're cutting the bottom first how much depth you've got for the top so you can go from 20 to 30 percent left just to be the crown of the stone so that's the most important part for us to get the right proportions and the right shape so we do the preforming and then we do the cutting of the bottom we do the rough diamond laps to start with on all the facets then we do a pre-polish with 9 micron or 1800 diamond grit on a copper lap. And then after that, we do every single, we make sure that's the really accurate stage of faceting. And then we polish those, come back to those facets and polish them on a tin type metal lap with 100,000 grit. So that way we get a really fine finish. All the points are meeting up nicely. When we satisfy that that's right without any scratches, we transfer the stone in a jig 
and then we do the top exact corresponding with the bottom gun through the same stages. So on a round brilliant with 57 facets, each one of those facets has been done with three different laps. So it's quite time consuming to get it really accurate and to, and to make sure that it's nice and clean. Um, and I guess what I've learned over the years from when I first started over 40 years ago is that you need to learn as much as possible about the stones and the industry and, and it's surprising how with fashion changes um, and demand for stones change completely, you know, they, they change gradually and can really, some of the stones that weren't that well sought after in the 70s, in fact they were the hardest ones to sell, and now become the easiest ones to sell. So I guess anybody that's, even, I, I, I get, it's hard in, in third world countries to consider you know, what, what to do, the value adding. But what I say to people here in Australia, the advice I give to people that come here in Australia is to, and have got a decent sized claim and want to become full-time miners, I said, you really need to do the faceting and the jewellery making, or do as much faceting of the stones, not only to, to sell the stones, because you can sell them on Facebook and Instagram, so that whole digital market has been a total um, new, new industry for us, but they that's the only way they really learn what a good quality sapphire is if they learn to cut themselves. Once cut and polished, a gemstone will be made into a finished piece of jewellery. Today, Peter's son Tyler is fashioning a gold ring into which he will set one of Peter's beautifully faceted sapphires. Each component of the ring is individually handmade, then joined together with the utmost of care. Once the ring setting is complete, it is time to set the polished sapphire. A sapphire takes a fascinating journey before it reaches our hand as finished jewelry. This process takes a lot of skill and a lot of time and effort, but when it is finished, I'm sure we can all agree that the results are fantastic.